Welcome to Project Freelance. My name is Kay Anagonio. What's up, guys? This is a podcast all about freelancing where I bring different guests on every week to share how they built their freelancing business or their entrepreneurial skills. And uh, it's my way of giving back to the audience who does all kinds of stuff. There are photographers that listen to this, musicians, audio engineers, uh, all kinds of different people that listen to this podcast. I want to know what you do as a freelancer or what you want to do as a freelancer. Hit me up on Twitter at Project Freelance if you guys want to share what you do as a freelancer. I would love to actually get you on this show if you are a freelancer and you've been doing this for a period of time. I'd love to hear from you. If you want to be on the show, hit me up at Project Freelance on Instagram. You can shoot me a DM or you can email me at contact at just the letter K dot com. This week on the podcast, I'm speaking with Sam Boone. She is a producer and audio engineer. She does both studio and live sound. Uh, She does everything from working with artists, producing, mixing, mastering, and uh, help them release music for pitching for sync placements, things like that. So we're going to be diving into a whole lot of stuff within the music industry today on this podcast. I know you guys are going to love this episode. It's one of my favorite episodes that I've done, and I've done about 200 of these episodes. So that's really saying something. It's an awesome episode. And before we get into it, there are a few housekeeping things I need to let you know about. The first thing is, if you're new to Project Freelance, please go ahead and just hit that subscribe button immediately because you're going to want to come back next week for more. You're going to want to hear more of these episodes. It's an awesome podcast. It's a great resource for freelancers. And I would love to hear from you. If you like the show, please leave a rating and feedback, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts. It helps this podcast grow on the Apple charts and it helps us find more people just like you to listen to the show. If you do leave a rating and feedback, please take a screenshot of it and send it to me at Project Freelance on Instagram, and I will actually send you a signed photo print of a picture that I have taken, either of an artist or an abandoned place that I've explored. When I'm not freelancing, I explore abandoned places. I have another podcast called No Tracers. It's all about exploring abandoned places. If you're into that, check out the podcast. It's good stuff. I love doing podcasts. It's so much fun. The last thing I need to let you know about is that we have a partner on this podcast, and that is Liquid Death Water. If you've never heard of Liquid Death Water, well, you probably don't spend enough time on the internet because their marketing and branding is all over the place. They have such a great marketing team, and uh, we are super happy to be partnered with them here on Project Freelance. If you guys want to know more about it, well, hey, I've got an ad coming for you in three, two, one. From the streams of the Austrian Alps comes a new kind of water. A water that is sure to raise you from your grave. If you're tired of buying cases of plastic water bottles that contain carcinogens and God knows what else, or if you're trying to lower your waste footprint, Liquid Death comes in beautifully rugged aluminum cans. Murder your thirst with a can of Liquid Death. Check the link in the description and use code just the letter K at checkout for 10% off your order. Liquid death, murder your thirst. So if you guys want 10% off of a case of liquid death water, definitely check out liquiddeath.com and use code just the letter K at checkout or hit the link in the description and we'll take you directly to liquid death with my affiliate link already attached and you can order one case, you can order 20 cases of water. You need water, you're a human, you gotta drink water. Why not drink the best water and help the planet at the same time? Liquid death water. All right guys, without further ado, Sam, can you please introduce yourself and what it is you do to the Project Freelance audience? Awesome, so hi, my name is Sam Boone. I am a songwriter, producer, and audio engineer. Um, I've been working, I work in both studio and live, which gets a little confusing, I think, for some people. Um, But I've been working in live professionally for about three years and working as a writer full time for five and producing for three. Wow. So multifaceted over here. I love that. I love that you do multiple things, uh, writer, producer, all kinds of stuff in the live entertainment. So what got you into music in the first place? Like what made you want to get into this industry? It's it's definitely a very uh, niche thing to do. So what what gave you the bug for, for music? Uh, so I'm from 
a fairly small town in North Carolina, so there's not a whole lot to do. So I grew up in a really, really small church, and I had friends that like played in bands and played guitar and bass and drums, and I always saw them, and I was like, man, I, I want to be a part of that, but like I didn't play anything. So, and I'm still not like a wonderful guitarist, um, but I wanted to contribute really badly. And in the back of the room, there was this soundboard looking thing with all the buttons and lights. And I was like, what's that? I want to push the buttons. Like, and I got really lucky and I had a mentor from like the age of 12 that they let me start learning sound and learning to run sound as my way to contribute to the band in this like teeny tiny church. And I just fell in love with audio and with music. So uh, one of my questions is actually about like mentorship and like, have you ever had a mentor? So can you talk more about that? Like, what did you gain out of that experience? Uh, So I've been really lucky to have kind of three major mentors, I think, throughout my career so far and throughout my life in general. Um, And so really starting off with that first mentor, I got really lucky and he was super cool and had like been doing it professionally and like had mixed Nine Inch Nails and crazy stuff and had like toured and like done it. And this was like his retirement, like I'm just here to help out. Like I just live in this little town. Uh, So I got really lucky with someone who knew what he was doing, which I think for me made all the difference in the world. And the biggest thing was really having an advocate and a mentor is being a woman. I don't like to say that it makes things difficult. I think it makes things different, but it has been absolutely huge to beyond any technical knowledge they pass on beyond their ability to pour into you and to explain what things do and why things work and how things are used and all the things that you could go get a degree for but the reality is you may or may not learn it when you do that Um, having someone there to just answer questions and give you a shot has been the most impactful thing in my life by far. So speaking of education, did you go to school for this? And and do you think that, I mean, you just said like, it's not really necessary, but like, did you go to school for it? Or are you completely self-taught? That's a really convoluted (laughs) answer. (laughs) Um, uh, I do have an associate's degree in fine arts. And I did a semester at MTSU as a commercial songwriting major. So I have gone to school for music. Um, I also grew up like being classically trained and all of that fun stuff. So I played oboe and did the whole symphony professor sit in the orchestra thing for a while. And I got really bored with that and I found rock music and that's been awesome. Um, But I don't think you have to go to school for it as long as you know how to teach yourself. I do think that... If you choose to go to school for a time, it does open up a lot of different opportunities, like some internships I've done that were incredibly helpful, that allowed me to meet some mentors that really got me my career, I think, in a lot of ways. But absolutely, it's not something you need to do as long as you are willing to put in the time and understand that. Whether you get a college degree or not, there's always going to be this aspect of trial by fire in the music industry, I think. So as far as like the the internship goes uh, and that kind of thing, a lot of people that listen to this podcast are like, how do I get an internship? Like, how did you find this op- these opportunities and how did you apply for them? Like, what was that process like? Um kind of by accident. (laughs) So I I did a mentorship with a record label out of Nashville for a while. And that was absolutely phenomenal. I mentored actually through their marketing department and learned a lot of really cool like back end skills that helped me launch my business and really connect with people and network. That was really helpful. And I met that mentor through Um, camps. I used to go to like songwriting camps and stuff every summer in Nashville starting when I was like 13. And they would, the label came in and had a number of like representatives. Like it was like the VP of marketing and a couple of producers, a couple of engineers, and obviously like an artist or two. 
And for me, they were there to answer questions. And I just had so many questions and I just asked, Mm. I, I just walked up to him and I said, Hey, I have all these questions. Like, would you be willing to take an hour and answer them? And so a friend of mine and a couple people from the label and I all went and had dinner um, with them. And at the end, I just said, Hey, would you ever mentor somebody? Like I just asked. And for some odd reason, he said yes and gave me a shot. Wow. But I think asking is huge. And then um, la- a couple years ago, I was in school to do a my commercial songwriting degree. And I was like, well, I'm already working on records. I'm already getting cut. Why am I getting a degree for this? And so I thought about changing my major to production and music production and formally studying that. And I said, well, before I go through this whole convoluted paperwork process of really changing my major, let me do an internship and see if this is even something I want to really, really do. Because I had done some production, but at the time I felt like I was really a songwriter. And so I had spent a lot of time working with producers and obviously working from live, like I understood what things are, how they worked, EQ, compression, transitions, all of that good technical mumbo jumbo. And I really was like, well, is this something I want to do? So I called up a production company that like a touring production company, because a friend of mine um, had some sort of like affiliation with them, like had heard of them and had recommended that I check them out. So I applied and went through that whole process and actually did a three month touring internship with them. And at the end, they hired me. And I dropped out of school. And that's the reason I never really finished my formal education. But again, I kind of got that one because I just said, hey, will you give me a chance? This is what I've done. And just, I think the reason I got really lucky and people gave me a chance is I walked in the room and they were like, well, what do you know? And I was like, I know nothing. Like, assume I know nothing. Because if someone is trying to teach you something and you already know that and you're sitting there going, well, I know what this does. I know what this does. They, they don't want to teach you anymore because then they feel a little bit like you're devaluing what they're trying to give you and pass on and bring to you. And so for me, walking in the room and just say, Hey, teach me. I'm, I'm this blank slate. I'm willing to do whatever you know, if it's wrapping cables, if it's soldering for six hours, if it's just doing the grunt work, like I'm okay with that. As long as you're willing to teach me something, I'll learn anything. I love that. I love that attitude. And I think that everybody should have that kind of attitude in in teaching situations like that, just because it does allow you to absorb more information. And it makes them like you said, it makes them want to to pass that knowledge on to you if you're if you're an open minded and you're an open book and a clean slate like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, it was really cool to be able to say, hey, well, you know, maybe I think I know something, but there's a really good chance I'm Mm -hmm. wrong. And so, you know, best to stay silent than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Yeah, definitely. And I want to go back to these music camps that you went to in like Nashville. So uh, because you were like in the kind of the church music scene at the beginning and these these music camps exist. Did you ever go to Camp Electric? Yeah, I was at Camp Electric yes. for like five years. You sound really. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. We So so I actually mentored with Full Circle oh, sick. Music. OK, yeah. So I, I went to Camp yeah. Electric. I don't remember what year it was. Oh, it was the year Michael Jackson died because I remember I was in the in the oh. cafeteria when they were like airing his like like procession funeral thing it was that year uh, and i remember yes. pillar was there oh, yeah. and pod was there oh my god it, i was that was one of the coolest things i've ever done in my life so sick it was it's a lot of fun camp electric's an yes. experience for those of you who don't know and are not familiar with it it is it is an experience so i was at camp electric from 2014 through 2000 oh lord um 
18, 19? Yeah, I'm going with that. Um, and a lot of it is honestly, even a lot of it really is just was a great ability to have mentors. Like now some of those instructors, like I call up and I'm like, dude, how do I fix this? Um, which is super rare. And I try not to make those phone calls, but a lot of times it's also really cool to just be able to have people that you really once looked up to. And now like when I'm in Nashville, cause I don't currently live there. Um, but I spend a lot of time there. And I do a lot of work out of Nashville remotely because I, I specialize in remote production and production for artist release and sync. Um, so, which is a really kind of weird space to live in, but it's a lot of fun and I love it. But all that being said is um, I now get to call my mentors and catch up that were my camp electric so instructors good. whenever I'm in town. And I really never thought I'd get wow. there. Yeah. Shout out to Camp Electric. Like what a cool experience that was. Like, I'm so glad like my parents let me go when I was a teenager and like, just let me do things like that. Like it was such a cool experience, man. Yeah. It's, it's an experience. Like there's really no other way to put <laughs> yeah. it. Um, and then talk to me about the first time that you went like into a studio or a live, live session. Um, that you actually got paid for? Like, what was that like? Were you nervous? Like, did anything go wrong? Like, tell me about your first time getting paid to, to do mixing. Who, um, well, rule number one, especially if you're working in live, something always goes <laughs> wrong. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be the biggest show on earth. You could be the best engineer in the world. You've got like a 90% chance something's not going to go exactly how you thought. And learning to live with that and know how to fix it is the most valuable skill set you could ever have. Um, and I learned that through things going wrong repeatedly. Uh, so that first time I got paid to like produce a project, um, it was a very nerve wracking. I, I think because, you know, it's a new thing. It's your first go at anything. And that alone is scary. But it was one of those things where I think I just put my head down and did it. Um, and so when I work with artists and, well, mostly with artists, but sometimes musicians or other producers, uh, they typically come to me with an idea and then we do the whole back and forth because uh, I really like that open communication. And so the first time I did it, the communication was the biggest learning curve. It was just learning how to say things to people because music is so subjective. And so you're trying to create this thing that is in someone's head. And I just remember being so afraid that I was going to miss the mark and that I wasn't going to be able to deliver um, and it obviously ended up going fine, uh, but I, I'm still standing, but it really, to me, just felt like this long, arduous process. But once I had gotten through the communication and kind of figured out just, you know, here's the goal, here's how we're going to get there. I felt like I just made of a planet attack and I just did it. Like it wasn't something that I felt like I had to overthink and I just remember being halfway through premix and going, Oh my gosh, I'm doing this. Like it's like that moment when you're riding a bike without training wheels for the first time and you look up and you're like, no one's wow. holding on. Like I'm, I'm actually doing this. Wow. Yeah. And that was the best feeling in the world. And I will never get over that. And even now when I do projects, I, it typically once somewhere along the line, I have this moment of like, but oh my gosh, I'm doing this. Like, this is my job. And that's not a new revelation, but it's still something that excites me. And I think those feelings more than anything else, like, I'm going to be honest, I can't tell you what song it was. Like, I have no <laughs> clue, but I remember those yeah. feelings. Wow. You remember the, the, the experience, but not necessarily like what the piece was. And I think that's the most important thing is that you remember that and you cherish the, that feeling that you had. And I think that kind of feeling, I mean, I feel, I felt the same way after my first like big gig, which was a music video for Lacey Sturm, who used to be in the band Flyleaf. Um, and as a metal screamer myself, like Lacey has always been a huge inspiration for me. And so the fact that, 
she asked me to shoot her music video for her first single as a solo artist was like monumental for me. And while we were filming it, I had that moment of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm doing this right now. Like I'm working with this incredible, incredibly talented artist that I've looked up to my whole life. That is like a hero to me. And, and I'm, I'm, they're my colleague now, you know, we're like friends and we, we talk on a regular basis and like, it's crazy that feeling that you get. And I think that's what carried me on and, and motivated me to continue going down the road. And could you say the same for you? Is that feeling something that helped you uh, like stay motivated to, to keep going? Absolutely. Um, and I, I think for me, like there's always going to be things that make me question my life choices. Uh, and a, a lot of it has been um, a, a good bit of sexism in my yeah. career. But in general, like that feeling of just saying, but at the end of the day, like I'm, I'm doing this and I am, whether you love it or hate the music, at the end of the day, like I am technically solid at what I'm doing and these feelings and knowing that like I still can hit all my marks. I'm still hitting everything I'm doing. I'm still executing well for my clients. I'm still able to create enjoyable relationships. I, I love people I work with. And so all of those feelings really have just absolutely on those days where you're like, why did I choose to do this? You then feel like that and you remember that's why. So speaking of like dealing with the sexism of the industry, can you talk a little bit more about what you've experienced? Because, you know, there are a lot of girls out there that want to get into this industry and they may not know what they're going to face. So can you talk a little bit more about what you faced and how you how you overcame those challenges? Yeah, um, so I think in between studio and live, it's very different. Uh, I've actually had far more sexism issues in studio settings and studio clients as opposed to um, live, which I was really shocked by. I really thought it was going to be the other way around. And it's not. So uh, honestly, for live, I choose to tour with a company 90% of the time for personal protection reasons, Uh, which I feel like is horrible to say, but I like having a backing with an HR department in case anything ever happens. And I know they have lawyers and I don't have to deal with that in terms of touring and live shows. Now I do freelance live and I just really, really heavily vet my venues and clients that I mix for live when I do it freelance because of those things. Cause you don't know who you're going to be working with and what kind of reputations they have and those sort of things. So I am a little paranoid about that for personal protection and just for the environment. like, I just never want to put myself in an unsafe or bad situation or be in an area that I'm unfamiliar with. And I don't know anybody else on crew and I don't have anybody else I can call. So I just do everything I can to avoid those live. Um, But that being said, I've actually never had an issue live and I love it. And I've met some of the most amazing people you know, they're just really cool. Uh, so I do absolutely love that. Now, in terms of studio, um, I actually had a lot of sexism from mentors, like not my mentors, but people who I thought would mentor me or give me the time of day and they didn't. I've had artists look at me and say, I've had like a mentor artist who I was asking for feedback. Like I've been in pitch sessions um, and have been told that if you're not if a female artist, like if you're not here to sing, if you don't want to be an artist, there's no place for you in this industry. You should go out. Um, and that's the first time I ever called my mom and said, I want to quit. And that is the only time I've ever called my mom and said, I want to quit. And she gave me a pep talk and that was the end of that. But um, so I, I do think that it, it people say some stuff. And you hear a lot of really negative things sometimes. But you always have to remember that, you know, you're there for a purpose. Like, you're there to serve somebody. And so just because somebody doesn't like something or because somebody thinks I shouldn't be in the room, it it shouldn't matter to me. And I've I've had to do a lot of growing and grappling with that. 
And some things I have done really intentionally, like I go by Sam and not Samantha. Um, And so my credits, like when they're listed, it looks like I'm a guy. And I unfortunately did that intentionally. And it has never hurt me. And I really wish that there weren't little details like that, that I always kind of at the back of my mind take into account. But they're there. And I think as long as we're okay with changing the conversation and changing the stigma around, you know, women being technical and women being technically competent in creative industries. Absolutely. Then it's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I obviously like my, the only thing I really deal with on a day to day basis, apart from a handful of events over the years that I can pinpoint where somebody was like, you shouldn't be here. And like, people will look at me and say, you shouldn't be here. Uh, I get a lot of like, Oh, are you the singer? When I walk (laughs) into a room, Um, that's my favorite. I I used to, whenever I was like engineering freelance and like I had a tech or somebody that was like working with me or, you know, if there's just like an intern in the studio or something like that, I'll, I'll look at him. I'll be like, hold on. I was like, I'll bet you five bucks in the next 15 minutes. I'm going to have at least three people that'll ask me if I'm here to sing. By the way, I can't sing on key to save my life. Nobody wants that. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of stuff like that. I've, I've found the humor in it over the years. Uh, it, I don't think it ever stops being annoying, but it doesn't hurt anymore. Yeah. And you can laugh at it now. Yeah. And I don't think it was ever like things like that. I never really had an issue with. It was just kind of like, really, dude, like you're, you're seriously going to ask me that again. Like I, there's not a microphone in my hand. I'm at, I'm not on stage, like context clues here, buddy. Um, but in general, people are really cool. Uh, and I've had a lot of really great opportunities and honestly, uh, in my production business and producing for artists and working with them, 95% of my clients are women. And that was never intentional. But for some reason, I think that sometimes women are just more comfortable having it be another woman you're working with, especially when songs get so personal. And if it's a song that, you know, talks about something like abuse or like things that hit too close to home, sometimes it's just a different environment and a different perspective and sometimes a different sound, depending on whether you're working with a male or female producer or really any producer you work with is going to have elements that are distinctly theirs, whether it's, you know, a certain lean towards a warmer mix or a colder mix or, you know, some people love kind of raspy vocals. Some people like to keep them pretty rich. Uh, you know, every producer, every musician, every creative has their kind of trademark tendencies that over time they kind of develop into your um, accidental style, as I call it. But so I I do think that I'm really glad that I've been able to produce for women because I I want to consciously create a space where if I can help and if it's going to make you more comfortable, like I'm absolutely here. Like I never was like, I'm only going to work with women. It was just women found out that I was a producer and I had kind of had some relationships and people just started coming to me saying, you know, Hey, I had a really good experience with you um, because I didn't think about any of this or I didn't worry about any of this yeah. or, and it was just a different energy or a different vibe. And so Um, I'm really glad I'm able to provide that until people get comfortable enough to work with a male producer if that's what you Mm. need. Definitely. Definitely. And can we talk a little bit about budgets? Like how did you figure out your, your worth, your value? Like how did you set your rates and, and how did you, uh, like grow them over time? Because I mean, I, I'm sure you don't have the same rate you did when you started. Oh, yeah. Um, That's a hard one. That's a really hard one for, I think, anybody. Uh, For me, my biggest, my biggest goal for my projects, for my clients, for everybody I work with personally is value for money. Is I understand music's expensive. And I try to price myself based on the people I want to attract. Like, I, 
I don't charge $1,500 a track because I want to work with independent artists. Like, that's my goal. So I have to keep in mind that with independent artists come independent budgets. And so um, I, over time, I think for me, I have raised my rights as, like, my prices and my rates as my skill set has gone up because I feel like that's just more value I'm able to add. Uh, I think every producer, you know, we start out doing tracks for nothing and then tracks for pennies and then whatever you can get. And then you realize, oh, wait, somebody else called and the phone keeps ringing. And I I guess if I'm going to spend all this time, I should probably be able to like support myself. Um, And I think we're always going to walk the line of, well, I want it to be fair, but also I got to eat. And so that's really hard. Um, For me, I've started breaking down my pricing based on service because I do, um, I do produce and I mix and I master. And so uh, sometimes I also get a lot of calls from other producers who are like, Hey, I've done this track and it's not quite what it needs. Can you give it a once over? And so at that point, like I'm, I'm going to charge more for a track that I have, you know, somebody comes to me as a singer with a work tape and says, I can, can you make this into something finished? You know, here's my vision. And we have those conversations and we go through the whole process that pricing wise and time wise and experience wise looks a lot different than if my producer buddy calls me up and says, Hey, I have this client who wants this thing. I know you're really good at pop vocals, or I know you're really good at rock guitar. Can you just give it a once over? Um, and so I, I always like to price based on what I'm providing. And then I always ask the budget because every project is different in terms of what it needs. So as much as I can, break down like this is where the money goes Uh, because I also like to use session musicians I think I'm a little bit old school in terms of I like real recordings I don't do a ton of programming Um, obviously there are elements in certain genres and times where programming sounds awesome and like that's what a song needs but if that's not what a song needs that's not where I naturally go to and so um obviously like the session musicians come out of the budget for a project. And if it's a smaller budget, then, you know, maybe we only use live drums and I'll track guitars instead of having um, like a really specialty, like session guy do it, things like that. So really for me, just being afraid to ask and own what you're worth has something that has come over time. And it feels like it changes based on the day, but I guess the reality, it doesn't. Um, Because sometimes producer as a woman, like, feels like a dirty word. Like, it feels like it's, like, a label that, like, you're going to be shamed for. Or, like, you're just waiting for someone to tell you you're wrong. And so it's really easy for me to be like, oh, I'll engineer this. Like, I'll just mix it. And I've really been pushing myself the last couple years to be like, but you're perfectly capable of full production. You do it daily. Yeah. Like you, you need to call it what it is and you need to price for what you're doing. Yeah. And I love that you use live session players. I think that's a great way to, you know, do that. If somebody comes to you and they're like, Hey, I want to work on this song, but I don't have a band. Like I love, like, I love that you have session players in your back pocket. Like how did you foster those relationships with those players? And like, where did you find them? And can you talk a little bit more about the importance of networking? Yeah. Um, So as cliche as it is, this is a who you know industry. Um, And I hate saying that, but it is possible to make it without being related to anybody. Uh, I personally have family with no musical background. I was raised by an engineer and a nurse. So I'm not sure how I ended up in music, but you know, it's it's going well. Uh, And in terms of networking, really... I think there's there's something called the personal value index, which is this... um, both economic and psychological principle that basically says uh, 
you know, you're, you as a person, whether you're providing a good or a service or an experience or whatever you want to call it, have to bring some value to the table. And so what you're able to give people and get from people is directly related to the value that you bring to that relationship. So like to my clients, I bring the value not only of what I can do technically and the relationship that we develop personally and in terms of just getting to know people and giving them the time of day. And I love my clients. Like I am friends with, like I've met so many cool people and I've been, I'm friends with some singers that are like, I need a producer. And like, I ended up producing some tracks for them and doing some songs with them. And we ended up being friends. Like we chat, like it's, I love that sort of thing. But also when it comes to finding those session musicians and finding studios to work with, um, I think looking for ways to give other people opportunities is the best way to start developing those relationships. Because as much as I'm like, you know, I, I want to get something out of this. Like I want to pay client as much as any, as much as the next producer, as much as the next session guy, as much as the next freelancer. Um, it's not about the money. It's, it's about the people. And so if there's a drummer who said, Hey, you know, I really want to just play on a track. And I'm like, look, you know, it's a really low indie budget, but you know, maybe we're friends or we've met through mutual friends or you were recommended to me. I'll give you a shot. Like, let's, let's give it a shot. And I'll, I'll tell you up front, like, this is my budget for this. If you tell me you can't do it, that's okay. But just know that like, I'm being transparent with you and putting all my cards on the table and saying like, I'm not trying to underpay you or undervalue you. Um, but like, I'm willing to give you a shot as long as you're okay with this. And a lot of my session guys that I use currently, um, I've met through friends or, uh, I'd, I'd mix them live or they were, you know, sometimes clients, but mostly just, people that you've worked with repeatedly. A lot of my favorite drummers I work with, um, I met them because I mixed their bands live. And then they were kind of like, well, I'm looking to do some studio work. I, I know you do studio work. You know, could I ever do anything for you? Um, that sort of stuff. And they're, they're just really cool people. Uh, I currently have um, a studio I work with and I have like a contract with a studio for their session musicians. Um, and I use them and that's been absolutely phenomenal to have that relationship to just be able to, you know, I don't worry about like, can I find a drummer? You know, can I find a bass player? Can I find whatever I need? If I need live cello, um, they have it. I am able to just call them up and book and know that like, this is how this deal works. Um, and that has been hugely, hugely helpful, both in turnaround time. And in just general convenience. Yeah, that's great. I, I love that you've got a contract with a studio and their session players. I think that's an excellent way to uh, optimize your your time and your energies, you know, to, to have something like that. Um, and then can you, this question could go either way. Some, some of my guests uh, don't want to answer it, but some of them are more than happy to share. Um, have you ever been screwed over on a job, not been paid for something or, you know, treated completely horrendously, anything like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I will say I, I've only ever done it once. Um, I've never knock on something. Uh, knock on wood. I, I've never had to just like say I regret my life choices when I did a project. Um, but it's gotten close. So for me, um, I do all my contracts up front. Uh, I, I outline deliverables. I, I'm OCD level organized sometimes in terms of I have my timelines. I, I like to make the deliverables, the timeline, the pricing, and the project as clear as possible out of the gate. Because I think that prevents a lot of that. Um, only once I've ever been doing a project and been like, I'm done, I'm out. Um, and the reason I now do 50-50 payment or stage payment is because of that, is 
uh, it actually wasn't a client. It was like a co-write. So it wasn't a paid project at the time. It was pretty early on. And I was working with a singer and we had written a song together and I was doing some production on it. And they just couldn't tell me what they wanted. Like I, I, I sent him a demo and I had asked for references and he wasn't really able to send me references. And he was like, well, I feel like I know what I want. And uh, on my end, I'm sure it was equally as frustrating to him. Um, but on my end, I felt like if he was unable to clearly articulate his vision, he wasn't going to be happy with anything I did because I was just trying to read his mind and that's unreasonable. Um, and normally I try to work through those things, but it was a situation where he was saying some things personally against me and I was like, look, I'm done. Like, I don't have to take this. This isn't a paid client. And so I just killed the project. I was like, I'm done. And at that point, I owned half the rights to it because I owned the writing because I had co-written it. And so I just let it die. Um, but I've actually never had a client issue where we couldn't resolve something or clarify something or work through something. That's good. Um, and I think working remotely, because I, I do specialize in remote production. So I do require, I do a lot of work with vocalists and that's why I have my full session players. And so we're able to supplement like bands and things like that. Um, I do require that the people I work with are able to kind of record themselves because I don't have a studio open for the public personally, just as a choice. Um, and also because I tour so much, like I want to be able to work from wherever I'm at. And so as long as they can record themselves and it's a clean recording and we can talk through it, I feel like we can resolve almost anything. Yeah. And I think it's cool that you specialize in remote production. I think that's super interesting. Uh, a lot of people choose to, you know, go one way or the other. So I think it's interesting to hear from, from a producer that works remotely. I think that's super fascinating. Um, and then can you talk about some of your favorite projects you've worked on, like some of your favorite artists you've gotten to work with? Yeah, um, so I, I do a lot of work for film and TV uh, and for artists who want to pitch music to film and TV. So maybe they're not known for their artist project, but like they're the music you hear on BET in the background when the car is driving or, um, you know, if if there's like Lucifer, like a TV show, uh, things like that, um, they, they need like these big guitar anthemic tracks or whatever. I, I get briefs. Um, and then I, when I work with artists, they typically want to also pitch it to film and TV. And so with that comes a whole nether set of rules and clearance and, you know, things we can't do and we can't use samples and a lot of other kind of guidelines. And so, uh, it's really, really fun to watch, clients succeed and so it's great when you're able to do a track for an artist like I just did one for an artist out of LA called Jay Edwards and we did this track called Can't Stop Us um, and I actually own a company that does marketing so we actually did the whole like back-end marketing for that as well in addition to myself doing the production um, as a part of the production team and writing team for that song and it was really cool to see him get really excited for it because it was a song that was just kind of written and uh, myself and another producer were working on it. And then we were like, it's just not doing what we need it to do. We need someone to bring, to basically breathe some life into this. Like we know it's technically solid and he was able to just bring it to life. And I love seeing artists put themselves into music and just make that vision come really from something in black and white to something in full blown color. And it was really cool because the track got picked up by a couple of like sync agencies and has been doing well. And so we were really able to check off a lot of his goals, like his bucket list things of, you know, like I want to get something synced. I, I want to have a song that does these things. And so it was really cool to walk through that process with him. Um, and then also I started off in spoken word and writing and working on spoken words. So um, Egypt Speaks is a spoken word artist and I co-wrote um, like a quarter of the Wanderer album and did a lot of work on that project in terms of just being really involved in the whole process with it, which was a lot of fun. Um, and I got to 
see it played live wow. in my hometown at an amphitheater of like 10,000 wow. people. And it's surreal hearing words that you've written and tracks that you've helped work on and stuff that you've done, like from your home studio, like from your a little corner of the world now in this like touring live show and like knowing the words that you said that are now being said back to you. And then you're hearing all these people echo it. Damn. It is the most surreal experience. Ooh, I got goosebumps. <laughs> to... That was, I think one of about three moments in my life where I was like, Holy crap. I made it. Yeah. Wow. Like that, that was it. And that was really cool. Cause that project got some radio play as well which was also really weird to hear things that like you've done being played back to you um, or bands you've mixed and you're like scrolling through the radio and you're like, and your friend's like, you mixed that. And I was like, Oh, that's weird. <laughs> I was like, Oh yeah. All right. We should, we should not listen to that. Cause like, I'm, cause I think as creatives were so critical yeah. of ourselves. And so I'm like, I oh, guess I hear all oh the details. God. I'm like, Oh, I should have done this or like, there's always the one thing at the end of every project where you're like, was that a good decision? <laughs> um, and normally 90% of the time the answer is yes, but it just kind of stays in the back yeah. of your head. And so when that happens, I do tend to be like, oh man, and like, let's change the channel. But I do listen for a couple seconds and go, wow, this is weird. Uh, oh, that's awesome. Wow. And so yeah. if, as an artist, like for example, if if Chasing Satellites was like, hey, we have this ballad coming out, which we do. Uh, we have this ballad coming out that we would love to get in, in a, a movie about space. Like, what what do we do with that? You know, like, can you can you tell me, like, from an artist's perspective, like, how do I go about doing this? Like, do I just submit it to somebody like you? Do I do I submit it to, like, an agency? Like, what, what do, help, help. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am not a sync agent. Uh, I just am a producer that sync agencies sometimes tend to call when they need tracks of like a certain type or like music supervisors will send out briefs. And I'm one of a lot of people that get told like, we need this. Do you have anything like that? And then in terms of like my personal music or like catalog, like catalog pieces or tracks I've done with other people that, um, I own or own portions of, uh, I can pitch and submit for film and TV. Now, as an artist who wants to get into sync, uh, you, there's a couple check boxes first. Like you need to make sure that like nothing's sampled, that it will clear, uh, if it's one stop and that's a whole bunch of legal terms, um, that is a whole separate thing. But the general consensus is to find an agency or a sync rep to represent your song and pitch your song to music supervisors and agencies. So agencies basically act as representatives and they have relationships with music supervisors that you can, that then will be the person to say yes or no, we're putting the song in the show. And if we're doing so, we're using this portion of the song and it's going in this episode. Like that is the job of music supervisors. And they have a really hard job because they get music constantly from every source on the planet. So they get overwhelmed. So agencies are a really good introduction because agencies will clear your music for you. They will make sure your metadata is okay. They will make sure that all of the nitty gritty contracts and sampling details and really they'll make sure that it'll clear. And that's a really, really big because if you send something that you say will clear and then it gets used or cleared accidentally and it shouldn't have, that opens everyone up to a lawsuit. And that is really bad and people lose jobs over that. So, yeah, it, it gets a little intense. But um, that being said, there's also libraries and music libraries are awesome to submit to because they will just put your project in and they'll if they accept it, they'll send you a contract with terms. So some libraries do things called retitlement, which means that they collect your royalties, but you get paid out sync fees. Um, it, it gets very complicated, but basically there's three ways to pitch and it's to agencies, to libraries and to music supervisors directly. I recommend libraries to start and then agencies after you develop a relationship or a couple relationships with agencies. Like I have two I really like that I like to work with and submit to a lot. Um, and then if you are choosing to submit to a music supervisor directly, 
you need to heavily understand sync. You need to heavily understand your rights and you need to know if something will clear or not because that's a big deal. Wow. That's thank you for like giving me all that information. That's super helpful for not only myself, but for artists listening to this podcast that, that want to get into, to sync. And I think that it's a great way to make, you know, more passive income off of your, your creations. I think it's awesome. So for, for you, because you have royalties on some of this music, the better you do, the better your artists do, the, the more you guys make at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we always want to make a track that serves its purpose. So I will say if you're someone who wants to get in the sync, you need to call a producer who understands what working in sync looks like. Um, And because on a production standpoint, that alone will make you or break you because your production is what will determine if it clears. Like there's a lot of rules that, you know, would make things okay for like a, a label release or a personal release. But not okay for sync and then beyond that um songs for sync are typically structured pretty specifically and they have like sections which supervisors can cut up and things like that that are designed to make it easier and more syncable so when you hear people talk about like oh is this song syncable like there's a couple things that make it syncable and i could talk about this for hours so i'm going to cut to the chase um but sync is a whole ballpark and there's people that make their money doing nothing but sync. And there's artists that are just sync artists that you've never heard their name, but you know, all their songs cause they're in all the TV shows. Um, you know, Ray L's a really good one. Ruel's a really good one. Uh, Aliana, like Lindsay Ray, it's they they get crazy. And so, um, if you're someone who wants to get into sync, please talk to a producer who, who does that. Um, and who understands those things because that I think not only is going to help you as an artist succeed because if you get something synced it's crazy how that can change your following how that can be your breakout song or how people discover you um, and you know what playlists you're even getting put on because you know now all of a sudden in addition to the royalty payments in addition to any sync fees so not only are you making more money but it's insane exposure because even if it's only 15 seconds, people can find it. People can Shazam it. People go, what is that? I like it. That sounds cool. Or every time it gets played on YouTube, if it's an ad, things like that. So cool. And yeah, I, I definitely want to dive more into sync, like as an artist, because, because of those things that you're talking about, like, you know, all that stuff is is super cool and it's such a a new area like a new arena for me to dive into and so like thank you for for opening up and and sharing about that um my last question for you is what is something you know now that you wish you knew when you started oh um that's a hard one there's a lot of things i i wish now that I think someone would have sat me down and told me that it's always worse in your head. Like as much as you hear that you're your own worst critic and that, you know, people are going to say things that make you question your decisions, whether it's technical, whether it's personal, whether it's your decision to be a freelancer, you know, why, why did I give up my nine to five? Why did I, put myself in this situation. I really wish somebody would have told me and just said, you know, it's, it's never as bad as you think it is. And more people succeed than you realize. A lot of times we're just quiet about it because we specialize and we're here for our clients and we're here for those purposes, you know, whether it's sync, whether it's women, whether it's advocacy, whether it's any subgenre that you want to pick, there's a producer for it. Um, and I really, really wish I would have gotten it through my head earlier that every time you feel like you can't do it, you're already 10 steps ahead of where you were. As much as you feel like right in this moment, this sucks. Like this, this problem isn't fun. Um, at the end of the day, if you ever decide to go back, you can. But 
this is the only way forward. And this is the only way you're ever going to get better is if you deal with all the sucky parts, because we like to talk about all the wins because they're fun and we love them and we're passionate about them and we should. But that's not to say that every pitfall diminishes every peak. Wow. That was incredible. Absolutely incredible. If people want to follow your journey or if they want to hire you to work with you, uh, where can they go online to find you? Uh, so Instagram, it's at officially Sam Boone. Um, on Facebook, it's Sam Boone. And then uh, I own a company called Indie Up. So you can always check out IndieUpArtist.com or my personal website, SamBoonePortfolio.com. And I answer pretty much every email and DM within reason. So feel free to shoot me a message, send me an email, just reach out, even if it's just a chat, even if there's just questions I can answer. Wow, that was my episode with Sam Boone. What an incredible episode that was. If you guys liked this episode and you want to check out more of Sam's work or contact her, I have put her information down in the description for you guys. If you did like this episode, please, please leave a rating and feedback. Let other people know what you thought about it. And if you do leave a rating and feedback, take a screenshot of it, send it to me at Project Freelance on Instagram or Twitter, and I will actually send you a signed photography print of a photo that I have taken as a way of saying thank you for doing that. It's free. It's a free way to give back to the podcast and help us grow on the Apple charts. So thank you guys for doing that. If you're new to the podcast, please hit that subscribe button. We have new episodes come out every single Monday with new guests. If you want to be on the podcast, please reach out to me. My email is contact at just the letter K.com. It's down in the description if you need to know how to spell anything. And uh, if you want to hit me up at Project Freelance on Instagram or Twitter because you want to be on the show, you can do that as well. Shoot me a DM, whatever's easiest for you guys. All right, guys, I will talk to you next week for another episode of Project Freelance. Stay strong, keep enduring, go out and go create something.